right, well, welcome to Celebration Online. My name is Steven. Thank you so much for joining us. We have an incredible service planned today. So before we even jump in, I wanna encourage you to hit the share button, let people know this is the place that they can come and be encouraged and challenged today. Now, just a second, we're about to begin our service by worshiping together, by singing a song together. But let us know what your favorite worship song is. Why don't you go ahead and drop it in the comment section. Let us know what's been encouraging you lately as you've been listening to worship music. Hey, let me go ahead and pray for us before we kick off this service. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together to worship you in spirit and truth. God, you truly are awesome. God, would you be with us today during our service? Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the sun. The Lord's name is to be praised. So we praise you. You call the sun to
will sing our God. He is an awesome God. He reigns. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Every day our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and All right, well, thank you so much for joining us here at Celebration Online. My name is Stephen once again. Thanks for being with us and connecting with us. If you're just tuning in, we just got finished singing how awesome God is, but let us know how awesome he's been to you. You can do that in several different ways. The first way is just go let us know right now in the chat box. Let us know what God's been doing in your life. The second way is by going to webcc.info and submitting a prayer request. There's a great opportunity there to find today's notes, submit prayer requests, but also you can give at webcc. I really want to encourage you to go ahead and open that up on your cell phone, on your browser, as Pastor Patrick Egan continues our God of the Broken Message series. Well, welcome to our online service. We're continuing our God of the Broken Message series. And so far, we've talked about how we can stay focused when things are challenging. And last week, we, we talked about how to break the chains of bondage there in our life. And as we continue to explore the book of Exodus, today, we're going to see how we need to protect what matters. Now, you may want to follow along with our online worship guide that's on webcc.info, uh, but I'm going to be reading today from Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. I invite you to follow along with me as I read. In Exodus 1, verse 15, the Bible says, Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua, when you help the women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this? He demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. So God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Now let's recap what's happened so far. Previously, we've seen that the Israelites are, are, are prospering. God is multiplying them, and this is causing Pharaoh of Egypt to feel a little bit insecure, and, and he even put them into slavery. He put them into bondage, and now he's so threatened by the growth of the Israelites that he gives the order to kill the boys who were born among them. Now, I want to draw your attention to verses 15 and 16 here. Where the Bible says, Then Pharaoh the king of Egypt gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. Aren't you glad your mama didn't name you Pua, right? He said, When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. I want to point out a couple things right off of the bat. Number one, this is a dark passage. And a lot of the things that happen in the Bible are dark in nature. Another thing, these two characters, Shifra and Pua, they're not parents. They're midwives. They don't have a relational connection or obligation to these children. And so today's message, this is not about parenting. As we talk about protecting what matters, this is about how all of us who are part of the community of God owe an obligation of protection to our young people. Another thing I wanna point out is this, children have always lived 
in a dangerous world. We see that in our passage. We see that in Matthew 2, as Jesus' parents have to flee because King Herod is killing the young children of his day as well. It was true then, and it's true now. And a phrase you'll often hear people say is, well, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. And I, you know, I have some issues with that. One of my issues is, have you ever seen a handbasket? How is someone actually going to fit the world in there? And when did a handbasket become a, a mode of transportation? Have you ever been talking to, to somebody who's like, hey, I'm going to Disney World. And you say, are you flying or driving? And they say, neither. I'm taking the handbasket. It's a phrase that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But it also, it doesn't reflect the fact that this world has been dangerous for a long, long time. Here we are in the book of Exodus and Pharaoh is seeking to kill the young boys. And I'm sure parents of the time thought to themselves, wow, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. And we go to the Jesus's day where God sent his son to teach us and to perform miracles and to teach us how to have a relationship with him. And we killed him for it. And it was bloody and it was horrible. And they remembered that day. You ask him, what kind of day was it? Was it Bloody Friday? Was it a Massacre Friday? They'd say, no, it's a good Friday. The world has been dangerous for a long, long time. And it's still dangerous today. That notwithstanding, all children are precious in God's sight. They're a gift. They're a joy. Jesus said in Matthew 19, let the little children come to me. Don't stop them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these elsewhere in scripture. Jesus refers to children as the model of faith. He says, you must have faith like a child. Understand this, he didn't point to, to parents or successful leaders or pastors or doctors or lawyers as the model of faith, he pointed to children. Now, we need to talk about some of the dangers that actually threaten children in our world because it is dangerous. Now, before children ever come into our world, they are faced with danger. Since 1973, there have been more than 60 million abortions performed in our nation. It's estimated that for every 1,000 live births, there are 135 abortions. Elsewhere, it's been estimated that roughly 18% of all pregnancies end in abortion. Now, I look at scripture in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, where God says to Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I look at that verse and it tells me that Jeremiah was very much alive in his mother's womb, that life begins at conception. And so from where I sit, that's the perspective of scripture. And the reality though, is that the womb is statistically more dangerous than riding in a car, than surviving a war zone. It's a dangerous place for our young people. And even after children are born, the world is still very dangerous for them. 48,000 of America's children are actually in prison. Five out of 10 American children live in a broken home. One out of every six children in America has a mental illness. And one out of four fourth graders has already experienced intoxication. 190,000 teenage girls in America will get pregnant this year. And that doesn't include those who will get pregnant and have an abortion. Those are heavy statistics. Can we just take a moment and, and breathe and let the Lord just kind of give us some peace and some refreshing here? These are heavy statistics, but they're not hopeless. And the situation in Egypt was heavy, but it wasn't hopeless. Verse 16 of our passage says, because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. And later on in verse 20, so God was good to the midwives and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Let me remind you today, as we talk about protecting what matters, protecting our young people, this is not about parenting. Sure, it impacts parenting, but it's not just for the parents. This is for the people of God. This is for the community of saints. We all have a responsibility here. You've heard the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. Let me tell you, it takes all of us praying and working together to protect our young people. We have been called by God to do that, to protect our young people from the pressures and dangers they face. And so today, that's the question we want to ask. How do we do this? How can we protect our young people from the pressures and dangers that they face. We'll talk about four major things. Number one, we can protect what matters by helping people guard the lives of our young people. We need to guard the lives of our young people. 
Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, way back early on in the creation story, scripture tells us this, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. You know what that statement tells us? It tells us that human life is valuable, it's precious. Human life is especially valuable to God because it's created in the image of God. Now, I recently came across a National Park Service pamphlet that told beachgoers and residents who lived on the beach uh, that they need to be careful about the sea turtles that nest on the beaches. Specifically, between May and October, their instructions were to limit your outdoor light usage in the evening so that the turtles don't get confused. And this is all part of an effort to protect sea turtles, which are an endangered species. And listen, I'm a fan of it. I love sea turtles. I think they're cute and I think they're precious. And one day in the distant, distant future, when I become an overnight success and I'm fabulously wealthy and have an $18 million mansion on the coast with a helipad and all that, I'll do a great job managing the light usage at my home to protect those little sea turtles. I'm for it. I'm a fan of it. Not just because I think they're cute, but I also believe we have a biblical responsibility as stewards of creation to do this. But here's my point. How can we be so careful with animal life? And how can we be so casual and careless at times with human life? Human life that the Bible says is made in the image of God. It's our first and foremost responsibility as people to protect life because people are made in the image of God. To put it another way, a preborn child in the womb is made in the image of God, just as an already born child is made in the image of God. Their lives are valuable. For that matter, a mother who has had an abortion is made in the image of God, just like a mother who hasn't had an abortion. She's valuable too. She's made in the image of God. This week, We had another happening in our world, and I just want to reinforce the fact that Mr. George Floyd's life, he was made in the image of God, regardless of what past or present troubles or struggles he may have had. And for that matter, Mr. Derek Chauvin, his life, he is made in the image of God, regardless of what terrible consequences he's caused. Yeah, can I just tell you, former President Donald Trump made in the image of God. President Joe Biden made in the image of God. Every person, regardless of what they look like, what they've done, what they stand for, they are made in the image of God. And this is so important to us because when we forget that people are made in the image of God, it makes them much easier to denigrate. It makes it much easier to deprive them of justice it makes it much easier to treat them as lesser than. I just want us to understand young people are made in the image of God, and that gives them certain certain preciousness, that gives them a certain value that needs to be protected. Now, I wanna share a really challenging scripture with you today. Proverbs chapter 24, it says, "'Rescue those who are unjustly sentenced to die. "'Save them as they stagger to their death. "'Don't excuse yourself by saying, "'Look, we didn't know. "'For God understands all hearts, and he sees you. "'He who guards your soul knew you knew. "'He will repay all people as their action deserves.'" Now, let me say that while life begins at conception, and it certainly doesn't end at birth, and when we talk about valuing life, I believe we need to value the life of the pre-born. I think we need to value the lives of those who are born. In the year 2020, just about every evangelical speaker said this. They said, if we're pro-life, we're pro-life from womb to tomb. I want you to think about that. From the moment life is conceived to the moment it goes into the ground, we need to be pro-life. Even Pope Francis got in on the action. He actually tweeted, every life counts from the beginning to the end, from conception to natural death. So how do we guard the lives of our young people? Well, we can guard the lives of our young people, number one, by supporting legislation that protects the unborn. I believe that's a good start, but it's a bad finish. It's where too many of us stop. We also can guard the lives of our young people by supporting organizations that support foster care in adoption. I want you to recognize that where we are 
in the state of Louisiana, there are more children needing foster care and adoption than there are foster families to provide it. And it's an opportunity where the devil can do great harm in the lives of these young people. There's a great organization nearby called Crossroads NOLA that works with churches to engage church families, Christians, in the foster care and adoption process because who better to take care of these of these innocent children in need of someone to care for them. We guard the lives of our young people by supporting organizations that support foster care and adoption and also by supporting organizations and policies aimed at addressing poverty, crime, and family wholeness. Listen, if all lives are valuable, if life is created in the image of God, it should be unacceptable for any child to have to walk through gang territory or past a drug corner on his or her way to or from school. That shouldn't be acceptable for any of our children. If all life is valuable, then we ought to protest when it ends abruptly and unjustly. We ought to grieve with every overdose. We ought to grieve with every mass shooting. We ought to grieve with every incarceration of a young person. Why? Because, because they're made in the image of God. Number one, we can protect what matters by helping guard the lives of our young people. We protect what matters by helping guard the hearts of our young people as well. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else because it determines the course of of your life. I heard the story of a man who had gone golfing with some buddies and he's out there at the golf course and he's uh, fixing to hit his ball when there's a funeral procession uh, driving by the road next to the golf course pulling into the, the church right across the street and as he's about to hit his shot he, he sort of steps back and he takes his, his cap off and, and holds it down and just has a moment of reverent silence for this funeral procession. Now his friends who were with him, they were pretty surprised by this. They'd never seen this kind of behavior before out of him ever. And they said, hey, what's up? Why, why are you stopping everything? Because there's a funeral going by. And the gentleman said, well, she's my mother-in-law for 32 years. I figured it's the least I could do. That's not the way to treat your mother-in-law. And can I just tell you, that gentleman, he had his heart in the wrong place, he had the wrong priorities, he had the wrong values. And that's what our heart is indicative of. It's our values. We need to teach our young people to value what God values. Uh, the great leader, King David, the Bible says, was a man after God's own heart. David valued what God's heart valued, and it ensured that David made the decisions that God would make as well. So let me ask, what is it that God values? And in our passage today that we talked about, Exodus chapter 1, 15 through 20, we, uh, we see several things that God values. Number one, God values faith. Verse 17 of our passage, because the midwives feared God. Now, I'm sure they were pretty impressed with Pharaoh's power and authorities, kind of a powerful guy, but they revered the Lord even more. Their allegiance to the Lord reminds us that our first and foremost allegiance should be to the Lord as well. And for all of our complaining about the habits of young people, the music they listen to, the way they dress, can we just take a moment to realize uh, what could happen in our world if our young people's first and foremost allegiance was to the Lord? The world would be turned upside down. And this danger we talk about within the world, many of those dangers would be subsided because our young people would be advancing. They would be leading God's work of awakening around our world. We also see that God values righteousness. Verses 15 and 17 of our passage, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shifra and Pua. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live to, you see, they weren't willing to compromise their values, even though it was Pharaoh telling them to do so. They, they weren't willing to compromise, even though this practice was accepted by Egyptian society. They wanted to do what was right instead of what was popular, what was legal, and even what was expected of them. And it's a stunning reminder that sometimes what's legal is not always moral. And sometimes what's moral is not always legal. And there may be times when our nation has laws that allow something that God calls immoral. And there may come a time where our nation has laws that forbid what God calls moral. We've got to be willing to value righteousness. And the third value we see in our passage, God values sacrifice. Verse 18, the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this? He demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live. Now these midwives understand that Pharaoh's willing to kill babies. If he's willing to kill babies, how much more willing is he willing to kill them 
for subterfuge of his plan. It's a reminder that in taking hold of Jesus, we have to be willing to let go of anything that isn't Jesus. It was Jesus who said, if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but are yourself lost or destroyed? God valued the sacrifice of those midwives. God values our sacrifice. And those are some of the values he wants to impart to our young people as well. We can protect what matters by helping to guard the hearts of our young people, also by guarding the minds of our young people as well. Let's, let's take another trip back into creation. In Genesis chapter 3, the Garden of Eden, we have Adam and Eve. And Genesis 3.1 tells us the serpent was the shrewdest of all wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden. That shows us a pattern that the devil and the world will often use to trip us up in our walk with the Lord. You see, the serpent sowed sin into the garden by causing Adam and Eve to question what God had told them. The devil knows that if he can get you, if he can get me, if he can get our young people to question what God said or whether they should even listen to him, then he can hold them in bondage. And what that means is that our minds are spiritual battlegrounds unfolding and we have to help our young people to guard their minds. How do we do that? Number one, guarding the minds of our young people takes fences. You understand the basic premise of a fence, right? It keeps out the things you, you want out. It keeps in the things that you want in. We have to help our young people build appropriate fences. Paul gave a good example of the things we want to keep out. He said, let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Such sins have no place among God's people. Obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes. These are not for you. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. Now, Paul mentions these things because they're unbecoming of the people of God, but he also mentions them because they can become bondages in our lives. You see, the devil is seeking to use ungodly entertainment, ungodly websites, and ungodly friendships to undermine God's will for our young people. I know a pastor uh, who was in a really busy season of his life, and he came home one day to find his 11-year-old son distraught. He asked his son what was the matter, and his son confessed that he had been looking at inappropriate things on the internet, and now he couldn't stop thinking about them. Come to find out this had been going on for a year. This was a kid who didn't even have his own phone. This was a kid who was very sheltered and wasn't around a lot of the problem situations we might assume would help create this. His parents took extensive steps to set up fences around his life, and the devil still found a way in. And one reason pornography is so destructive to our minds is because God didn't design the human mind to cope with pornography. So you can imagine how difficult it was trying to help an 11-year-old recover from an exposure like that. Listen, that's what the devil is wanting to do in every single young person. His parents had great fences set up, and sometimes even our best attempts to keep the world out will eventually fail. It's a reminder that our young people need more than protective fences. We need to recognize that guarding the minds of our young people takes focus as well. Proverbs 22.6 says, direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. You know what I can recall of Christian guidance in my high school years? It basically amounted to this phrase, don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with girls who do. It was strictly, don't do these things. And these days, I feel like there are a whole lot more things to not do. I heard about the story of, of two boys who were hanging out near an apple orchard. And uh, the owner of the orchard saw them and walked over and said, boys, are you trying to steal my apples? And one of the boys said, no, sir, I'm trying not to steal your apples. Have you ever tried to not do something? How'd that work out for you? Listen, it's really hard to try not to do something. The best way to help young people keep out the bad stuff is by helping them to focus on the good stuff. The psalmist wrote, how can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word. You know, I've heard that when they're tra training federal agents to spot counterfeit money. They don't lock them up in a room with counterfeit bills. They do the opposite. They lock them up in a room with real money. The philosophy is this. The more they understand what real money looks like, the better they will spot something counterfeit. That's the power of focus. We need to be helping our young people understand the real 
true virtue of the Lord and his goodness so that they'll understand counterfeit when they see it. And one thing our church is doing in May, and this may be of interest to you, is we're working with our middle schoolers and our, 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 our youth. We're doing a study for them in the month of May to help teach them more than just avoiding sex. We want them to understand God's design for it. We want them to understand the value of purity. This is a part of us helping our young people build fences and focus into their lives. We protect what matters by helping to guard the minds of our young people and finally by guarding the souls of our young people as well. Not to take away from some of the former statements, but I need to say this, life, life is precious. It's beautiful. It's a gift from the Lord. It's given to us. We are created in the image of God. It's valuable. And while life is this precious gift, it's not the most precious thing God has given us. Protecting our young people, their lives, their hearts, their minds, it all builds up to this. And if we don't do this, it might have been all for nothing. We have got to help our young people connect to Jesus, surrender to Jesus, and follow Jesus. And Jesus said this, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? My fear is that as a society, we do a lot to help our children gain the world. We help them be great at sports. We help them get great scholarships. We set them up for good careers. But what are we doing with their souls? They found that roughly one in 200 male high school senior boys will get drafted into Major League Baseball. That's 0.5%, one in 200. They found that if your sport is basketball, your odds of playing in the pros drops to one in 3,000. The odds of becoming an astronaut are one in 1,250. The odds of becoming a U.S. congressperson are roughly one in 600,000. But the odds of standing before the Lord and giving an account of your life? 100%. All of our young people are going to stand before the Lord and give an account to the Lord. So the best thing we can do to protect what matters is to help our young people develop a vibrant relationship with Jesus who will carry them through their high school careers, through their college careers, through their, their, their working careers, through their family years. See, this is a job for parents and our community alike. Many young people turn away from the Lord as they get older because they haven't seen enough genuine, vibrant relationship with Jesus and older people. Sometimes it's because they haven't been a part of the adult congregation in their whole lives. They, their family was a part of church. They, they went to children's ministry and graduated up to youth ministry and maybe got engaged in college ministry. And there they are, 25, and they've never connected with anyone who's a part of the adult group of the church. Sometimes this happens because adult Christians they know have been poor examples as well. The questions to ask are, number one, when our young people age out of their youth ministry, will they actually know other adults in the congregation? Maybe you could be one of those adults that they know by engaging with them now. The second question is, have our young people seen what real faith looks like? We've got to show our young people real faith. Let me get back to verse 17 of our passage. Because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. It's a reminder that the burden of protecting our children is more than just a burden for parents. It's a burden that belongs to our whole community. Maybe you don't like kids. That's okay, I'm sure they don't like you either. The feeling is usually mutual, but they're made in the image of God. We as the people of God are called to help protect them you know, there are a lot of ways that you can do this. You can do this inside of our church by being a part of our Kids Town Children's Ministry, our, our Midpoint Ministry for, for junior high students, our the Social Youth Ministry for 8th through 12th graders. But there are a lot of community organizations that work outside of our church to invest in the lives of, of young people. Here at Celebration, we have a Life Transformation Center that is aimed at, at helping meet the needs of people in our community. We have one of our staff members who's involved in a ministry called Reset Camp that is about contributing to the lives of teenagers. We've got other organizations that we work with from time to time like Trinity Community Center, Jesus Project, Next Generation, Each One, Save One. And if you go to webcc.info, you can find links in our sermon guide 
to these organizations. I learned this week that the ancient Romans employed a military formation called the Testudo, which literally translates to tortoise. And it looks about exactly what you'd expect. It involves soldiers carrying heavy shields that are about three feet high and about 18 to 24 inches wide. And, and what they would do is they would form a perimeter around a group that needs protecting and, and kneel down behind those tall shields. And then a, another group would come behind them and lift their shields up so that the top of the group is protected. And it ends up looking like a giant turtle shell and they would form this formation around anyone who was sensitive among them, maybe among light infantry or commanders, even baggage animals that were carrying the luggage of the soldiers at the time. They would, they would form this sort of tortoise shell of shields around what they were looking to protect, and no arrow could get through, no stone could get through. It protected anyone and everyone who was inside of that formation. That's what I think it's incumbent upon all Christians to do for our young people. We've got to gather together and we've got to place shields of faith around our young people so that no arrow of the devil, no stone that he can throw can knock them off of the course that God has for them. This is why this is about more than just parenting. This is about us as the community doing what it takes to protect what matters. I want you to join me in praying. Let's pray for our young people. Heavenly Father, we know that all life belongs to you. We know that all life is created in the image of God. And Lord, we know that some of those lives are vulnerable. They require added attention. They require added protection. Lord, today we heard the story of Shifra and Pua who did what it took to protect the young Israelite boys. They were willing to do so at great expense, at great risk. Why? Because they were faithful, because they believed in righteousness, and because they were willing to sacrifice. So Lord, my prayer is that the people with us today, that they will have that same faith, that they will have that same calling, that same boldness. Lord, I pray that you will help us do what it takes to protect the lives of our young people. Help us to do what it takes to protect the hearts of our young people. Help us do what it takes to protect the minds of our young people. And help us do what it takes to protect the souls of our young people. Lord, may we be like an army of believers, of Christians, surrounding those who are vulnerable with our shields of faith protecting them so that your hand can be upon them, so that they can grow up to fulfill your plans for their lives, Lord, so that they can be great leaders in your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as Pastor Patrick said in the message just now, that this message isn't strictly for parents, it's for everybody, and I agree, because I was challenged, I know you were as well. Something he said that stood out is that every person is made in the image of God, and that should drastically impact the way that we interact and we treat the people that we come into contact with. Look, I really wanna encourage you to stay connected with us and also to share this message before you head out today. Make sure you click that share button, make sure you subscribe, whatever platform you're on, and hey, I wanna let you know that on our Celebration Church YouTube channel, we're dropping music videos on a weekly basis, so if you wanna be encouraged and to listen something, to stream something during the week, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for being here as we continue our God of the Broken series. Can't wait to see what happens in the coming weeks. You have a great week.